And this practice uh, was in response to all of the rawness, all of the anxiety, all of that sense of bewilderment and fear that was a consequence of 9-11, um, of, of just the, the confusion and the hurt and the um, kind of uh, bewilderment of that. And um, it's a very powerful practice. And when it was first offered um, in New York, it was initially offered for all the persons in the towers, for the first responders, for the friends and family of the people in the towers, for the friends and family of the people in um, who were the, the first responders, for the people in Pennsylvania, for the people in the Pentagon. It just kept kind of going out and out and out for the leaders in the United States, for the leaders in other countries, for the families and friends of, of leaders, of public servants. So it just had iteration after iteration after iteration. And at one point, the uh, Meta was offered to the friends and families of those who were responsible for, um, for this tragedy. And it was really powerful to recognize that those persons who had committed such great harm and who died committing this, this harm also had friends and family that really cared deeply about them and were heartbroken by their, uh, by their deaths too. And for many years until uh, the pandemic stopped us all in our tracks, I would go usually twice a month to uh, a maximum security men's prison in Minnesota. And we would do a, a mindfulness practice and a body scan and we'd end doing um, a loving kindness practice. And this was the practice that seemed to really resonate with, um, with the guys who were there in very difficult circumstances um, and who were really trying to live without harming themselves, without harming others, and really cultivating states of, um, of ease, states of kindness, states of compassion, being able to be happy for one another's uh, little successes. So that's the practice I wanna do with you tonight. And then um, in my talk, I'm going to um, go through all of these uh, wishes that we have and talk about them more deeply. So loving kindness practice is, um, is at its heart um, a practice of kindness toward ourselves, of taking care of ourselves. So when we do this practice, it's important to be in a position that is comfortable for you. So if you like to sit up, um, some people really like to lie down to do loving kindness practice. If you prefer, you could turn off the video uh, while we meditate if that is helpful to you, um, although I hope you'll come back on with video when we, when we talk. But just have this intention about really taking care of yourself, really investigating what it's like to really act out of a sense of kindness toward your body, toward your mind. And the other suggestion I, I have is really let your whole self come into this room that no part of you has to be left out. Even if there is, uh, you think that there may be some aspect of yourself that is grumpy or cranky or <coughs> not very loving and kind, that's welcome too. All parts of yourself are welcome here tonight. <clears throat> 
okay? And our idea is to abandon any, any ill will toward any of that, okay? So we're just gonna sit with this sense of uh, wishing for the welfare. I sometimes think about metta as this um, benevolent wish for the welfare of ourselves and for other beings. So let's begin. So in this practice, we usually begin offering these wholehearted good wishes to ourselves. We see these as aspirations for our own well-being. So visualize yourself if you can, either as you are now, or if it's helpful, you could visualize yourself at a time when you really could use some, could have used some support, maybe a time when you were really vulnerable in your life and you'd like to take care of that, that younger self. May I be well, safe, and peaceful. May I be well, safe, and peaceful. May I be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, and ill will. May I be free from the suffering caused by fear, by anger, by ill will. May I find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May I find forgiveness 
for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May I cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May I cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May I live in peace and harmony with all beings. May I live in peace and harmony with all beings. Continuing to have that sense of yourself, that image of yourself. May I be well, safe, and peaceful. May I be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, and ill will. May I find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another.
May I cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May I live in peace and harmony with all beings. And just continuing to tenderly hold this image of yourself, holding it in great kindness. May I be well, safe, peaceful. May I be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, and ill will. May I find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May I cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May I live in peace and harmony with all beings. And you can continue to offer these good wishes toward yourself. Or if you'd like, you can Choose someone who is dear to you, someone you care about deeply, maybe someone who's inspired you. And you don't even have to know that person personally, maybe someone that you've just really admired. I often think about Jane Goodall and Joanna Macy, the Dalai Lama. So just choose someone for whom it's very easy to offer these same good wishes. May you be well, safe and peaceful. May you be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, and ill will.
may you find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May you cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May you live in peace and harmony with all beings. And just notice how it feels to offer this person you care about the very same good wishes that you have for yourself. Feeling that bond. how beneficial these wishes are that we have for ourselves and we have for our dear one. So continuing to visualize that person, may you be well, safe and peaceful. May you be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, ill will. May you find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May you cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. And may you live in peace and harmony with all beings. Continuing to offer this to this person who is easy, easy to share these good wishes with. May you be well safe and peaceful. May you be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, ill will. May you find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another.
May you cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May you live in peace and harmony with all beings. And you could continue to offer these good wishes to yourself or your dear one. But if you'd like, you could also bring into your field of loving kindness into your mind's eye, either friend or maybe a group of friends, maybe family members, a person or persons for whom it is easy to continue to offer these same good wishes that you have for yourself. So visualize that individual or that group. May you be well, safe, and peaceful. May you be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, and ill will. May you find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May you cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May you live in peace and harmony with all beings. May you be well, safe, and peaceful. May you be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, and ill will. May you find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. <clears throat> and may you cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May you live in peace and harmony with all beings.
Now, loving kindness is called one of the immeasurables, one of the boundless qualities. So tonight in our boundless field of loving kindness, let's bring to mind some of those groups of persons who are uh, really challenged right now. And let's begin by bringing to mind those who have been most directly affected by the pandemic. And you can make this group as large as you want. It might be doctors, nurses, all the people who staff hospitals. You might include public health officials, all the people who've been sick, whomever you'd like to include in this offering of goodwill for persons affected by the pandemic. Just let your imagination take them in. May you be well, safe, peaceful. May you be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, and ill will. May you find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May you cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May you live in peace and harmony with all beings. And just feel the strength of that wish that you're extending to all these persons. May you be well, safe, peaceful. May you be free from the suffering caused by fear, by anger, by ill will. May you find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May you cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity.
May you live in peace and harmony with all beings. And then let's bring into our field of loving kindness all of those persons who have been affected by the uprisings, by the injustice, thinking of the people on the streets of Louisville tonight, but all over, all over who in the words of the Beatitudes, those who hunger and thirst for justice, We bring them into our field of wishing well for their safety. And we can include anyone at all in this. May you be well, safe, peaceful, May you be free from the suffering caused by fear, by anger, by ill will. May you find forgiveness for the inevitable harm we bring to one another. May you cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May you live in peace and harmony with all beings. May you be well, safe, and peaceful. May you be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, ill will. May you find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May you cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May you live in peace and harmony with all beings. And now in our boundless, boundless field of loving kindness, we can bring in whomever our hearts resonate with right now, even some difficult persons, whomever we'd like to offer these good wishes to. So just visualize 
individuals or a group. May you be well, safe, peaceful. May you be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, ill will. May you find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May you cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May you live in peace and harmony with all beings. Just letting that resonate. And now we combine everyone that we, that each of us has offered loving kindness to together in this boundless field of wishing well, of wishing for the welfare and the happiness of all. May we all be well, safe, peaceful. May we all be free from the suffering caused by fear, by anger, by ill will. May we all find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. And may we all cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May we live in peace and harmony with all beings. So take a minute and stretch and um, when you can, come on back into the Zoom room. So what I'd like to do um, this evening is to talk about uh, each of those aspirations and kind of unpack them uh, a little bit. And um, feel free either if you have a question and you just want to ask for a clarification or something, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in, or you can also um, put something in chat if that works better for you. But the first aspiration here in this practice is, may I be well, safe, and peaceful. When I think about wellness, I think about a kind of um, flourishing, flourishing of mind, 
flourishing of body. And we also know that many times people are uh, living with difficult physical conditions. So the idea, may I be well, is also, may I live well with what this, what this current situation is. Um, some of you may be um, familiar with the wonderful um, teacher, um, Tony Bernard, um, who has written um, a book called How to Be Sick. And she's someone who has had um, a really incapacitating um, post-viral syndrome for, I think, almost two decades now. Really incapacitating, really unpredictable. And she's written a wonderful book about um, how, to, how to be sick and another one about sort of how to live well, living well even when one is, is sick. So this idea of may I be well, May I be the best I can, given my situation. May I be safe. And we often think of that as free from outer harm, but also free from inner harm. Um, that we, we have a feeling of safety when we can trust awareness, when we can trust compassion. Um, when we can trust our community. And this, I think, is one of the you know, primary, primary uh, sort of creaturely wishes that we have for ourselves. And you know, our pets want to be safe. Small children want to be safe. It is such a creaturely thing to want to feel safe, to feel that one is not going to be harmed. And I think what our practice brings to us as a dimension of this is also that we want to be free from inner harm as well as outer harm. We want to be free from the sort of uh, mental activity that just proliferates around suffering. And when we talk about being peaceful, we talk about being free from uh, from strife, um, free from you know, harming. But we can also, from a meditator's point of view, again, think about being free of the hindrances in our meditation of you know, craving and aversion and restlessness and torpor and, um, and doubt. So we can also, when we start to unpack this, that's a way to be peaceful is to be free from the the mental hindrances in our, our meditation. May I be free from the suffering caused by fear, by anger, and by ill will. And it's important that we're talking about looking at the suffering that's a consequence of of fear and anger and ill will. Um, you know, this is a time of great uncertainty. Um, you know, it's a kind of liminal time right now where there aren't some clear horizons, like especially around the pandemic, that things are just kind of in limbo. And right now there's a lot of uncertainty um, politically in terms of, of what's going to happen um, in our country. There's a lot of uncertainty around um, climate change and, and um, so one of the ways that we uh, can work with this is not to is to really bring a kind of careful attention to the mind and not engage in uh, catastrophizing, in projecting, in, in sort of feeding anxiety. I mean, 
I think we're all living with, with some sense of uncertainty, some, uh, some dis-ease and our, our practice is not to squelch it, but not to feed it. You know, it, it's, um, there's this wonderful word in, in Pali called papancha, which is kind of, sounds like popcorn kind of, it's kind of like when the mind just sort of gets on a, on a roll and, um, you know, you can just start going down the, the rabbit hole of how things can only, only get worse. And uh, what if, what if, what if, and um, it's really important when that starts to happen to pay attention to the suffering. And I really notice this with, um, you know, people I talk with my, my friends about really um, not getting into the sorts of discussions that just uh, sort of regurgitate and um, just feed the anxiety. And I think that that's really a place where we can really use our mindfulness practice to just pay attention to, um, to the suffering that, um, that occurs when we, um, we really feed, um, feed our, our anxiety. And um, you know, I, watch, I watch a lot of news. I get the New York Times every day. I'm not someone who I spend more time on Facebook than I'd like to admit. Um, so I'm not saying that, that we shouldn't, uh, should avoid the news, but to just really notice when our relationship to it becomes, um, really becomes unhealthy. And I would say, and especially notice those conversations um, with friends that just you can just see where, where they're going um, in terms of just adding to anxiety. Um, and I also notice that when I bring mindfulness to that kind of fear, I notice that there's, that there's a lot of sense of separation in that, you know, us versus them, um, this, this sense of, you know, protecting myself, my family, my friends. And I just really try to bring my attention back to that noticing, oh, okay, here's really a sense of separation and that there's some real suffering in that. Um, anger can be really useful when it stirs us to um, address injustice or, or injury. I mean, anger is often a really natural response to, to something. But I think about the utility of anger. Anger is like the thing that lights the torch so we can see what's going on. When we start to burn the house down, then it's not helpful. So anger can be illuminating. It can be, um, it can be really helpful and it is a, a really natural response, but I see it as the, the sort of first step in something else then that happens. To stay in a perpetually angry state is just, again, to, to really, um, it's sort of, of self-devouring. And, um, and if it's really hard to stop, I would say just really bring this kind compassion to the suffering in it. Bring in a lot of self-compassion um, around that. And, uh, and notice, notice how much suffering comes from um, sort of stoking the flames of anger. There's a lot of righteous anger and a lot of anger that, that uh, you know, incites people to do something that is very um, constructive, but when it's just anger for the sake of being angry, 
it's, um, you know, I think the, the expression is, it's like taking poison, hoping it will kill someone else. But the anger um, that, and again, it's sort of like, like fear. You can just watch and see how much of it is sort of a natural arising in the moment and how much of it is um, sort of being, um, being fed by um, unwholesome states of mind. See what we're, what we're feeding in, um, in the mind. And ill will is, is really interesting. It's an attitude of wanting harm to come to another um, or wanting another, and this can be you know, an individual or a group, um, not to succeed. Want harm or you'd like them not to succeed. And um, it's, um, the Buddha talks about it as something that really harms us to have this, this ill will. It is harmful, harmful to ourselves, but it's not, um, it's not about um, not wanting justice. It's about wanting someone to be hurt for the sake of being hurt. And, um, and it's also very much attached to implicit bias about just not liking certain groups, thinking certain groups are better than other, other groups. And the abandonment of ill will is really the foundation of loving kindness practice, according to the Buddha. That, that is the, the, the foundation of it is to really abandon this, um, this idea. Um, may I find forgiveness? for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. The um, early Buddhist idea of forgiveness is very much tied up with this notion of um, ill will. That in uh, early Buddhism, and they don't talk about forgiveness a lot, but the understanding of the text is that if we let go of the <clears throat> of ill will toward the person who has, has harmed us, let go of that, that is, is essentially having forgiven a person. It doesn't require reconciliation. It doesn't require uh, repair. It's about ourselves not suffering from a heart that wishes harm. That, uh, that if we have a heart that wishes harm for another, that that is, <clears throat> That is a, a form of, of suffering. And it doesn't mean that the person who has committed the harm should not suffer the consequences. It's not in any way <clears throat> in opposition to justice. You know? And the Buddha talks a lot about karma and the, <clears throat> the consequences of harmful acts is often harm to um, to that individual. Um, so when we look at forgiveness in this, this kind of way, we both look at it as may we find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May we forgive and may we be forgiven. And especially um, we think about the inevitable harms, the sort of harms that we commit out of ignorance, um, <clears throat> out of thoughtlessness, um, and that they are almost um, inevitable. Um, you know, I, I can think of instances where I have said something that was just, um, thoughtless and, and hurtful. I, mean, I still <clears throat> think that it was probably five years ago, I said to someone at um, uh, a Zumba class I was in, I said, well, when is your baby due? 
and this person was not pregnant. And I mean, it was just, it was totally, it, I, I was, I realized how much I'd hurt this person. And I, my perception was a person would only look this way. She was a young woman. And, and, you know, I still think of that with, with great, um, uh, really a, a sort of a, a hurt in my heart about that, having, having hurt them. I also, many years ago, talked to someone who had cerebral palsy about someone else being wheelchair bound. And he said to me, am I tied to this chair? Am I chained to this chair? I choose to use a wheelchair. And that my sick, using this phrase wheelchair bound really stripped him of this idea of agency. You know, again, it was um, said out of ignorance and out of thoughtlessness. And the Buddha says, you know, we do this sort of thing and we do it out of ignorance. And that really shows us where it is that we need to bring our attention when we make these sorts of mistakes out of, um, out of ignorance, out of thoughtlessness, out of not paying attention. Um, now there's a lot of talk about microaggressions and how often, um, particularly people of color talk about, you know, racism and microaggressions that just go on all the time. And, um, you know, we may say, well, I didn't know, I didn't realize, I didn't know that would be offensive. And then our, our job is to really learn from that and to really work on, uh, on our ignorance. But, um, but the heart of this is that we have to see that, that holding on to um, grievances um, is really harmful to us. And I want to say as a caveat here, there are persons for whom there have been the sorts of um, traumas inflicted where this is just not applicable, where there is such, such deep hurt and such a need for healing and compassion. And to talk about this kind of forgiveness is just glib. This is really uh, has much more to do with our ordinary day-to-day -day, um, harms that we, we bring to each other. Uh, this is something that, that for a person who has had, you know, harm and trauma, this is really not something that's very, very relevant or very useful. And I just want to um, put that in, in there. And we wish for people to be able to cultivate um, these qualities called the Brahma Viharas, the um, divine abodes. Um, you know, and, and the Buddha says that these states are always available to us, either loving kindness or compassion or appreciative joy or equanimity. One of these states is always available to us. And what I think is very interesting about them is that each state has what's called, each one of these mind states has a near enemy and a far enemy. And the far enemy is the mind state that's the opposite. And the near enemy is the mind state that sort of is, disguises itself as the um, as one of the Brahma Viharas. So for example, loving kindness, which is you know wishing for the the well uh, the welfare of others, uh, wishing for others to be happy. The opposite of that, the far enemy is hatred. that we can see that coming from a distance. The near enemy, the mind state that um, pretends to be, uh, can be mistaken for 
uh, loving kindness. In the, the, the classic sort of translation of the text is attachment. But I think for us, what makes much more sense is to translate attachment as codependence. So it's that kind of neediness. Um, we want the other to be happy because we need the other to be happy. So that would be the, the near enemy of loving kindness. <clears throat> For compassion, which is you know, seeing suffering and wishing to alleviate it. And sometimes we can't, sometimes all we can do is sort of bear witness. But suffering really is, is seeing, seeing suffering, I'm sorry, compassion is seeing suffering and our response is to want to alleviate that, that suffering. So the far enemy of compassion, the opposite, is cruelty. The near enemy is pity. So pity may look like compassion, but in pity, again, there's a kind of separation that there's the person who is suffering and pity kind of pushes us away that that's not me. So it's, uh, it can be mistaken for compassion uh, superficially, but it's a very different, different mind state. For appreciative joy, which is also sometimes called altruistic joy, sympathetic joy, gladness, it's delight in the good fortune of another, which is, uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, some people think this is, is really the hardest for people to, to truly delight in the good fortune of, of another. And that may have something to do with our individualistic capitalist society, but I, I think it's a, a really um, beautiful, beautiful mind state. Um, clearly, the far enemy, the opposite of it, is going to be envy. And again, the way that the near enemy gets translated um, often, which I think is, is not quite on the mark, is exuberance. Like, that's that sort of um, you know I win the lottery and you're you're happy for me because you think maybe you'll get something out of it. Um, another way I, I think another clear example of um, the near enemy in appreciative joy is what I call condescending joy. So um, you know I tell you that um, you know well, you know oh I'm so happy my you know, my kid got into the University of Minnesota and he said, oh, I'm so happy for you. That's great. That's wonderful. And you're thinking, yeah, my kid is going to go to Harvard. You know, that, that sort of um, wishing someone well for what they have, but it's not what you would ever, ever want. And, and again, it, what we see in that is that sort of separation. So it's not a genuine gladness with that that person. Um, and the, um, the fourth Brahma Vihara is equanimity, which is, um, it's a lot like serenity in the serenity prayer, but it has even more nuances. It's um, sometimes people talk about it as um, being non-preferential. Uh, and, you know, for example, uh, we would want uh, a referee in a game to be equanimous in that way. We want a referee in a, in a sporting game not to have a preference for a team. Uh, we want a jury to be equanimous. So it has a lot to do with that sort of fairness of, of not preferring, a kind of fairness in it. Uh, sometimes we talk about equanimity as being balanced, um, not tending to extremes. Um, Another way it's understood is to be equally close to all things, um, that we, we give everything our mindful attention. And the examples that are often given um, for equanimity in, um, 
in, in sutras are like being like bamboo that is, uh, you know, really is very, very strong, but, but is very flexible. Um, sometimes people talk about, you know, like a great tree is an example of equanimity, of being able to just bear any, any storm. Uh, some people have talked about equanimity as a really nimble ship that can, um, you know, um, stay upright in all sorts of weather, whether the seas are, um, you know, calm or whether they're agitated. So equanimity is this, this very, very rich, very rich um, state of mind that's about um, balance. And um, the far enemy of uh, equanimity is reactivity. It's when we're being really reactive to things. Um, and the near enemy is indifference. And it's, it's kind of, a, sometimes it's sort of a, a slippery slope to uh, be equanimous with something um, and not be indifferent. But um, these are all states of mind that are um, equally um, available to us, or I should say equally available. But the Buddha said, no, we can always find one of these. The mind can always be in one of these heavenly places. And if there's, uh, you know, and um, loving kindness or metta is often sort of the default, just being in this general state of, you know, wishing, wishing well for all beings. This, this, this friendliness of um, benevolent well-wishing for all. Um, I think in, uh, you know, in this time, equanimity is something that's really useful for us. Equanimity in the sense of not falling into extremes. Equanimity in the sense of being balanced, of being, um, of like the bamboo, being able to, um, to bend and then come back up. That sort of resilience of bamboo. So equanimity, I think, is, is a great um, support for, um, for resilience. Um, and uh, the final, um, and then the last one of these phrases is, may I live in peace and harmony with all beings. And that's really the aspiration of um, a bodhisattva, not to be separated, to really um, be connected with this, this great web of life and to offer whatever is needed in the moment. May I live in peace and harmony with all beings. Uh, I'll tell you, this is just a little, um, this is, it, it makes me smile when I think of it. Um, I knew someone who was a, a Quaker, who was a student, who was studying Buddhism and, and uh, you know, we talk about this sort of concern for all beings. And she said what she loves about the Buddhists is that they're the only um, religion that she knew of that was sort of willing to uh, have good vibes for extraterrestrials to, uh, you know, at least imagine the possibility that there may be life beyond us and that we would wish that life well. So I, I it just makes me smile when I think about that because I had not thought about it. So I'm going to conclude with two little, um, two examples of this aspiration. And the first one is, um, Shanti Devas. And Shanti Deva was a, a fifth century uh, Buddhist practitioner and sage. And this is um, from his, he, he wrote a book called The Way of the Bodhisattva. And um, this has really been an influence on the Dalai Lama. And this is one of the, um, I think this is the daily prayer of the Dalai Lama. And it's, may I become at all times, both now and forever, a protector for those in need of protection, a guide for those who have lost their way, a ship for those with oceans to cross, a bridge for those with rivers to cross, a sanctuary for those in danger, a lamp, for those without a light, a place of refuge 
for those who lack shelter and a servant to all in need. And that's really, I think, a beautiful and um, exalted aspiration. And, you know, maybe on my, on my best days, that's how I am. But Larry Yang, who is um, a wonderful teacher who is with the um, uh, Insight Meditation um, out in the East Bay Insight Meditation uh, community, he this is his prayer of aspiration. And he says, this is a prayer of aspiration I developed in my own practice to remind myself how broad and deep the practices of the heart actually are. May I be as loving in this moment as possible. If I cannot be loving in this moment, may I be kind. If I cannot be kind, May I be non judgmental. If I cannot be non judgmental, may I not cause harm. And if I cannot not cause harm, may I cause the least amount of harm possible. And I think that the humility uh, and the, uh, the sincerity of that just really strikes a chord that some days, you know, I am ready to be the bridge, the servant, and other days, you know, I just feel like, may I cause the least harm possible. So there's this great, um, spectrum for us that we can keep practicing in no matter um, where we are, where our hearts are, um, to come back to an aspiration. Um, and it may just to do, be to do the least harm possible. And sometimes it may be to really be able to uh, root out harm completely. Take that, the Buddha talks about a thorn in the heart that is hard to, hard to find, but once removed leads to the end of suffering. So thank you for your um, very kind attention. And um, if you'd like to uh, comment, you can just unmute yourself or you could put something in the chat, but I'd love to um, hear if anything landed for you or was useful, or if you have any questions, that's fine too. Well, we can, um, if no one wants to say anything, we could end just by sharing the merit, uh, which is um, a beautiful uh, act, I think, of imaginative generosity. It's where we, um, again, come to sort of our, our heart and our beautiful intentions and offer to share any goodness that we've had with others. So just take a moment. And just reflect on the goodness of your being here tonight, that you were able to follow through with your intention to come here and to practice. And that's not easy life often gets in the way of our good intentions. So just really appreciate your participation here tonight and feel the support that we give to and get from each other. How at any moment, any moment, we can know that there are other persons who are just like us with the aspiration of non-harming and of waking up and of being, being a force for good in the world. 
So we really do support each other in this practice. And if there's any benefit to our practice tonight, if we have, have gotten any benefit from it, any merit, if we could, we would joyfully, happily, gladly share that with others, share that with those who are near and dear to us and share it with strangers share it with people throughout this city, throughout this state, throughout our country, throughout the world. Even if there's life on other planets, we would offer to share our goodness with that too. And let's especially tonight hold in our hearts all those who hunger and thirst for justice whether it's environmental justice, racial justice, political justice. And wish to share whatever, whatever good we have with those brothers and sisters. May we all be well, safe and peaceful and may we live in harmony with all beings. So thank you all for your sincere, sincere practice tonight. I was really glad to be with you.